though not too far away. This is my first time speaking in Atlantic City. And if you wouldn't mind me saying so, my first time power lectures have always been some of my most memorable. In fact, I can't think of a debut that I've ever had in any city around the planet that was not a memorable experience. So when I meet my New Jersey family tomorrow, my Atlantic City, New Jersey family tomorrow, I'm sure that will be a quite memorable experience as well. Driving in tonight, one of the things that shocked me and startled me so much, and I don't even want to use the word shock and startle because I understand that this is the reality all across America, but it was amazing to see how on one side of the street, you have Atlantic City casinos. On one side of the street, there's the Trump Casino, the Trump Towers, there's the Bali's, the Golden Nugget, all these different casinos that make millions of dollars every single week. And right across the street from the casino, right across the street from a multi-million dollar casino here in Atlantic City are our people. Black people living in poverty. How can you have a project across the street from a multi-million dollar casino? And that's exactly what you have here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So tomorrow, I'm going to try to raise the roof. We got some brand new I Am Nat Turner hoodies, Psychoacademic Holocaust, the most important book in the black community today will be available in Atlantic City for the first time tomorrow. We have opening acts, local leaders, local organizations, local businesses, local politicians. They're all coming out to show love to the Prince of Pan-Africanism tomorrow. Now, I just had a thought. I needed to write it down. Y'all know I have ADHD, right? And so African destiny hyperactivity disorder. I have African destiny hyperactivity disorder. That means all kinds of thoughts be coming to me and shooting into my consciousness from the ancestors and supreme consciousness in the Orishas and the Loas and the Abusums and the Netteru. They're always firing ideas and insights into Dr. Umar Johnson's consciousness. So I have ADHD, African Destiny Hyperactivity Disorder. Facts. Facts. But anyhow, brothers and sisters, in two years, in two years, we will be celebrating 400 years of black oppression in America. 400 years. I didn't say 400 years of us being in America because, as you know, many of us were already here. But in terms of the organized oppression, August the 21st of 1619 was the first day of slavery in the 13 colonies. Yes, we know there was Africans in other parts. I'm not dealing with other parts. I'm dealing with these United States that grew from the 13 colonies. That's where my ancestors was enslaved. I know some of you Negroes, you're not black, you're not African. You come from the sun, the moon, you come from under the earth. Some of y'all come from the inside of the ocean. I'm not dealing with that nonsense. I'm dealing with people who know they black, love being black and ain't trying to escape from their blackness. That's what I'm dealing with. So we will be celebrating 400 years in two years, four centuries. And after four centuries, black people still suffer from a 400 year old learning disability. We still haven't learned our lesson. Every black person in America needs an IEP. Because you have an inferior education plan. You haven't yet learned white supremacy. So what I want to do tonight from Atlantic City is I want to talk about 10 lessons that slavery has taught black people over and over again. Jim Crow has taught black people over and over again. The 21st century Holocaust has taught black people over and over again, I want to deal with 10 lessons 
that we should have learned and still have not learned. We have a political learning disability. We have an economic learning disability. We have a social learning disability. We don't learn. So let's talk about the lessons that our oppressor been trying to teach us for 400 years, but we don't want to accept and understand. Lesson number one. God only helps those who helps themselves. Let me say it again. God only helps those, helps those who help themselves. One more time. God only helps those who helps themselves. Now, any of you who have studied slavery, I'm not talking about the kind they put on roots or the kind they put in 12 years of slave, not the romanticized version, but true chattel slavery by Africans in America was holy hell. Chattel slavery by Africans in America was holy hell. It lasted for 243 years on this soil and even longer in other places. In Brazil, longer. Certain parts of South America, longer. So, what do I mean when I say God only helps those who helps themselves? If God did not intervene when black women were being raped, if God did not intervene when Africans were being snatched from Africa, if God did not intervene when white male slave owners were practicing pedophilia on black children in slavery, if God didn't intervene when black men and women were being hung and babies cut out of our sister's stomach, if God didn't intervene when the penises were castrated and the toes cut off and the slave master's name branded in your flesh, if God didn't intervene then, guess what? Why in the hell would God intervene now when those very same people have a billion dollar, excuse me, a trillion dollar economy that they don't want to put to use to benefit their children. If God didn't intervene in slavery, God damn sure ain't going to intervene in the 21st century Holocaust. You on your own and you will not get any divine assistance until you begin to give yourself your own assistance because God only helps those who helps themselves. We went through two and a half centuries of that slavery. We've been going through four and four centuries of white supremacy. God ain't coming. And guess what? Guess what? For my Jesus people, guess what? If Jesus is coming back, he's not coming back to save you. He's coming back to put his foot in your ass. Let me say it again. If Jesus is coming back, he is not coming back to rescue black folks. If Yeshua bin Yusef, the black Christ of Ethiopia, if he comes back, he ain't coming to save you. He's coming to put his foot in your ass because you don't deserve any saving. Facts. Facts. When Jesus come, you Negroes going to have to run. He ain't coming for the white folks. He coming for the black folks because the white folks is doing what white folks do. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. They on their job. They on their job. Oppressing, genocide, misery. That's what they do. That's what they here for. Your job is to resurrect human nature. That's your job. Jesus is coming to put his foot in your ass. So you don't want to see Jesus, trust me. Not the way you Negroes been living. So I'm saying this to say we have to stop relying on supreme divine intervention to solve our problems when we have the ability to solve those problems ourselves. Let me say it again. We have to stop relying on supreme divine intervention to solve our problems when we have the ability to solve them ourselves. Can I give you some examples? Let's take the school system. God, please fix the schools. Make the schools better for our children. God is not going to answer that. 
because the science of prayer dictates the science of prayer dictates God only intervenes and supplies you when you don't have the resources to supply yourself. So because black people have the resources to build your own schools for your own children, God is not going to fix the schools because you have the ability to fix them yourselves. You only pray for that which is beyond your power to do. Harriet Tubman prayed, but she only prayed for things that were beyond her power to do. Queen Mother Harriet Tubman knew that it was within her ability to help rescue Africans. So she did not pray for Africans to be rescued. She did it herself. But what she did pray for was for God to give her protection while she was saving black folks because she could not protect herself while she was on the Underground Railroad. Frederick Douglass didn't pray for freedom. What did he say? He said, I prayed for 20 years. Frederick Douglass, who we remember yesterday, his Earth Day yesterday, said, I prayed for 20 years, but God didn't answer me. These are the words of Frederick Douglass. I prayed for 20 years, but God did not answer me until I start praying with my what? Until I start praying with my what? Frederick said, God didn't answer me until I started praying with my feet, with my feet. I don't know who that is. Yes, that was Notorious. That's my theme song. Rest in peace, Christopher Wallace. I'm the new Big Papa. Do you feel me? Prince of Pan-Africanism, P-O-P-A. If you don't understand, you better ask somebody. So anyway, Frederick said, I prayed for 20 years on my knees, but God did not help me until I got up off my knees and started praying with my feet. Facts. So God ain't coming to help black folks. Jesus ain't coming. Nobody's coming for you because you only get divine help when you help yourself. That's lesson number one. We still ain't learned it. Y'all in church every Sunday. Lord, Lord, stop our kids from killing each other. Lord, stop our kids from killing each other. Lord, but why are our kids killing each other? You know why? They're angry and they're mad and they're pissed off because they broke. They ain't got no job. They've been miseducated. They go in and out of jail. And the same Negro praying to God to stop black men from killing each other is driving a $80,000 car, $400 pocketbook, $100 Timberlands, $150,000 mortgage, nails done, haircut every week eating out at white restaurants every weekend, millions of dollars on Christmas gifts, 600 million on McDonald's every year, 2 billion on Ed Jordan every year, 4 billion on alcohol and malt liquor every year, 9 billion on weave and perm, and you got the nerve to go to church and ask God to stop the black boys from killing each other. God ain't the reason they killing each other. You the reason they killing each other. Stop praying for things you can repair and fix yourself. Facts. God don't be in these churches. The Lord ain't in the church. And guess what? You shouldn't be. You should be out saving souls instead of getting them ready to die. Facts. You should be out saving souls instead of getting them ready to die. No disrespect to the church. I'm a descendant of African Methodist Episcopal preachers. Many of the grandfathers of revolutionary pan-African nationalism were pastors of the church. Henry Highland Garnett, pastors of the church. Alexander Crummel, pastors of the church. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. So I don't have no problem with preaching in, in church. 
I got a problem with preachers who don't do the work. Do you know the black church was born out of the black revolutionary struggle? The black church was birthed out of black protests and struggle. What happened to it? What happened to it? What happened to it? My Muslim brothers, what's one of the hadith of Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him? Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, black man from Arabia, said even work is a form of worship. Muhammad said work is a form of worship. So you want to go to the mosque and keep praying all day, but the prophet of your religion said work is a worship. So why your ass ain't in the neighborhood working, working? I live in Philadelphia, millions of Muslims, more than any city in America. Where the jobs at? Where the schools at, Aki? That long beard don't impress me. What is you doing for our people? And that's why a lot of blacks don't go to the church or to the mosque. Because you're not dealing with the everyday problems of black folk. You're just giving them another escapism. Another root of escapism. And if your religion is a root of escapism, it ain't serving God. It's serving the devil. Facts. Don't misquote. Christianity ain't the devil's religion. Don't misquote. Islam ain't the devil's religion. Don't misquote. But when you belong to a religion that doesn't serve the best interests of the people, then you in your religion, not the religion, in your religion. See, there's the religion that is and there's the religion that you practice facts. Don't confuse what you do with the original form and protocol that was passed down from those who brought the religion. God helps those who helps themselves. That's rule number one. We ain't learned it. 400 years in two years, we ain't learned it. What's the second lesson slavery should have taught black folks? Lesson number two, white folks will never give you freedom. You have to take it. Let me say it again. White folks will never give you freedom. You have to take it. Let me say it again. I don't care how many laws Donald Trump signed. I don't care how many treaties, bills. You will never get freedom until you take it. Harriet Tubman took it. Sojourner Truth took it. Ida B. Wells fought for it. You got to take it. And y'all keep begging for new rules. Y'all want new laws. Congressional Black Crime Caucus. We want more laws. We want laws. Do you realize no law can change the way white people feel about you? Do you realize no law can change the way white folks feel about you? And why is that important? It's important because you want to be accepted by your oppressor. Facts. You Negroes don't want your own community. You don't want no black Wall Street. No, you don't. You want to live with them. You want to sleep with them. You want to worship with them. You want to marry them. You want to work with them. You don't want no black power. You want white acceptance. Facts. I was on an interview today, good interview, by a sister. I think she was former Miss America, well-spoken queen, beautiful sister. Shout out to all the black women out there. I love y'all, all my sisters, my butter almonds, my butter pecans, my lemons, my, 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 my uh, vanilla beans, my chocolate, my lattes, my caramels, my coconuts. Shout out to the queens. But I was talking to the queen today and she said, Dr. Johnson, do you think it's a good thing that we have our own Grammy Awards, that we have our own Emmy Awards, that we have our own Miss Black Americas? Is that a good thing or should we just force the white people to treat us fairly? I said, sweetheart, let me tell you something about America. Let me tell you something about the world. No one in America 
practices multiculturalism except black people. Let me say it again. Nobody in America practices multiculturalism. Nobody believes in it. Nobody thinks about it. Nobody practices it except you self-hating Negroes. Listen, everyone who comes to America comes to America to build a cultural empire. Chinese are trying to build a cultural empire. European Jews, a cultural empire. Latinos and Mexicans, a cultural empire. East Indians, a cultural empire. The Irish, the Italians, a cultural empire. They not coming to work with nobody. They coming to build for self. Facts. You the only person talking about, can we be accepted? Nobody dealing with acceptance. They dealing with power. Power. Chinese ain't looking for unity with other people. They want power. Anglo-Saxons ain't looking for unity. They want power. Everybody fighting for power. And the black man and woman are fighting for participation. Can I say it again? Everyone else in America is fighting for power and you're fighting for participation. Let me say it again. Every racial group and culture in America is fighting for power and you Negroes are fighting for participation. Will you please let us in? Can we move in your neighborhood? Can my kids go to your white academy? Can we pray in your church? How can the people who has done to you what white folks have done to you, how can they respect you after all they've done to us? How can they respect you when you still begging, still begging for them to let you in? I got my hoodie on. It's a little warm in here. That's okay. Papa could, you know, lose a couple pounds. I'm just telling the truth. And I'm not trying to win no popularity contest. So I don't care if you don't like it or not. I know some of you bougie, talented 10th Negroes is watching me right now. And you can't stand my guts because I'm exposing you Negroes. And you don't understand why this black man with six degrees, a doctorate, three white. you Why are you making trouble? Why don't you just join the team? I was not sent here by Most High. I wasn't sent here by my ancestors. I'm not walking with Garvey and Douglas so I can sell out my people. My name is Ifa Tunde. Destiny has returned to explain. Expose your ass. I will never be a bourgeoisie. You keep your secret sodomy societies to yourself. Keep your secret sodomy societies to yourself. I don't want no parts of it. I don't want no parts of it. If I'm not pledging to black folks, I don't need to be with it. Not interested in it. I respect what you belong to, but I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in what's going to free black folks. I am a pan-African pragmatist. I am a pan-African pragmatist. If it does not benefit black folks, I don't want it. Okay? There is no neutral. So if you bring me to something where you say this is neutral, it don't help us, but it don't hurt us, then it hurt us because we are in a crisis. So you can't be bringing me anything that is irrelevant because we are in a crisis. We are living in right now a 21st century African Holocaust. I'm going to say it again. A 21st century African Holocaust. Our date of extermination has been announced. Our date of extermination has been announced. Why do you think they shutting down all the black schools? Why do you think they building more prisons? Huh? Why do you think they taking the hospitals out of the inner city? Huh? Why do you think they promoting sodomy amongst black boys? They are eliminating black folks with your participation. With your participation. So the second rule, you're not going to get it unless you take it. Nat Turner said, I'm going to take it. Gabriel Prosser said, I'm going to take it. Denmark Vesey said, I'm going to 
Take it. Harriet, I'm taking my freedom. Frederick, I'm taking my freedom. Henry Holly Garnett, I'm taking my freedom. Talking about you want unity amongst the races. Heard a Negro the other day said we need to unite with the Latinos. No disrespect to the Latinos. No disrespect to the Latinos. Most of them black anyway, but don't want to admit it. But they not going to work with you. Nobody works with black folks. Nobody working with you, especially not no immigrants. Are you crazy? You think an immigrant is going to risk the chance of being deported by immigration and customs for being caught at a meeting to help black folks? Are you crazy? Don't you know white folks make it clear to immigrants that you better stay as far away as you can from black folks? I got Africans who I know who have told me when they come here to get naturalized and become citizens or to become even a student on a student visa or work, they are told in no uncertain terms, get away from them. That's why you don't see them around us. Ain't nobody coming to help you. You won't even help yourself. You don't even help yourself. You know what makes your Holocaust so unique? Let me tell you what's making the 21st century African Holocaust so unique. What makes the 21st century African Holocaust so unique is it's the first Holocaust. Listen. Listen. I'm teaching. It's the first Holocaust in human history. It's the first Holocaust, yours right now, 21st century Holocaust, is the first Holocaust in human history where the victims, the victims participated in their own annihilation. Facts. You participate in it. And let me say something to you gangster rappers. Let me deal with this. I got to say something to the gangster rappers. I know a lot of y'all support me, y'all text me, y'all show me love, but I got to say something to y'all Negroes. And I ain't talking to all of you, but most of you. Now, those of y'all who come with a balanced album, I'm going to grant you a little bit of a respite. Because at least you got an A side full of garbage, but you got a B side full of positivity. So at least you try it. I'm going to work with y'all. I'm going to work with y'all. But you Negroes who got... 12, 15, 16 albums of gangsterism, selling dope, sexually exploiting black women, going to jail, worshiping European materialism. You Negroes ain't nothing more than a modern day Uncle Tom, Uncle Remus, buck dancing coon ass, worshiping materialism, got our kids strung out on cars and clothes. You Negroes ain't nothing but a modern Sambo ass. You so gangster. You so gangster, but you don't never talk that shit to them white executives in New York, Atlanta, or LA. Them white boys tell you fake gangsters where to go and what to do. You Negroes need to get your act together. Facts. I don't care if you don't like it. I'm tired of turning on the damn TV and I see Negroes worshiping chains, worshiping cars. The only black women in your video are the highest, yellowest, yellowest, yellow. And some of you Negroes got videos now where all the women in the video is white. Use a damn Uncle Remus. You ain't no gangster. Use a Uncle Remus ass Negro. Take it. I don't care if you don't like it. You Negroes ain't helping nothing. Every rap song, the same shit. Money, women, kill somebody, go to jail, smoke some weed, worship materialism. Money, women, kill somebody, go to jail, smoke some weed, worship. I'm tired of hearing it. Is y'all tired of hearing it? Because I'm tired of hearing it. Every album is the same. It might be a different rapper, different uh, uh, click, different city, different flow, different beat. But the content is the same. You Negroes ain't doing nothing but advertising mass incarceration for our boys. Your ass ain't no better than Donald Trump. In fact, Donald Trump need to take all you fake gangsters and put your ass in the White House. And y'all need to put on a suit and tie and work for your damn president. Because your ass is doing more to get black men locked up than any police department in America. Let me say it again. You Negroes are doing more to get black men locked up up than any police department in the United States of America. Fake ass gangsters. 
white man tell you what to do and where to get there, but you so tough in the hood. You want to bang on somebody, you ain't banged on none of them yet. Sit your ass down. Y'all want to impress me? Let me tell you how you can impress me, Mr. Gangster Rappers. Listen up. This is what y'all need to do. I'm talking to the hip hoppers. This is what y'all need to do. And if it don't apply, it don't apply. It apply to most of you. There's a few exceptions. I'm not going to call no names. There's a few exceptions. But this is what y'all rappers need to do. I'm going to teach you how to change the game. All the major rappers in every city need to come together and start an unapologetically African credit union for the brothers and sisters in the hood who want to start their own business. Let me say it again. All the rappers in Atlanta need to come together and start an unapologetically African credit union. Take your money and put it in the credit union. And some of y'all have so much, y'all can start a bank unapologetically African bank of black infrastructure. That's what you do. Look at all the rappers in Atlanta. All y'all living in Atlanta. You got rappers, athletes, R&B singers, retired celebrities. Y'all need to come together, start a board. You ain't got to put all your money up. You ain't going to lose it because banks make money. Banks make money. Banking is the business of America. Hell, the United States is a damn bank. Do you feel me? The United States is a bank. Come together, start a board. You can start a small bank with a million. You Negroes got more than a million dollars. Y'all need to start a large bank. 20 million in equity. All y'all put in the, the top 20 black entertainers in Atlanta, Georgia, need to put up a million dollars a piece. Now you got 20 million dollars. Okay, and then because y'all so popular, guess what? Everybody gonna put their money. Every we gonna leave Wells Fargo. We gonna leave Bank of America. We gonna leave Chase Manhattan. We gonna leave Mellon. We gonna leave all the banks because everybody wants to be where the rappers is at. The minute one of y'all get on TV and say we got a bank and all of us is going in on the bank, put your money with us and we giving out low interest loans to black folk. It's a revolution. You rappers could start a revolution. Y'all could start a revolution. All the rappers in Atlanta. Then you come to New York. Look at all the rappers in New York City. What if all the rappers in New York City put up a million dollars a piece? Every rapper in New York City put up a million dollars a piece. 20 million. And y'all can have several banks because there's so much money in Atlanta and in New York. Los Angeles, same thing. New Orleans, same thing. Philadelphia. Our actors and athletes and rappers and R&B singers and neo-soul singers, y'all need to put up a mill piece too and start that bank. If it can't be 20 million, it could be 10 million. If it can't be 10 million, it could be five. Y'all can change the game. That's the least y'all can do, promoting this damn genocide. Now, I know what you're going to say. And, and check, check, check. Y'all will make more money as a bank executive than you will ever make selling your albums. Facts. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. Y'all talking about getting ripped off by the music industry? You will make more money as a bank executive than you will make selling your albums. Facts. You will make more than you make on your concert. Facts. I'm telling y'all how you can save yourself, become independent, and save the hood at the same time. Let all the blacks come together in every city and start opening up banks. Banks! Could you imagine if you saw a bank with some of these rappers' names on it? Could you imagine if you saw some of these rappers doing a commercial for a bank? Do you know what y'all would, would trigger an economic revolution? And before I move on to my next lesson slavery should have taught us, I know some of you rappers are saying, well, listen, Doc, how are you going to blame us for crime? How are you going to blame us for jail? How are you going to blame us for materialism? It was around before we got here. Well, guess what, gangster rappers? You're right. You did not invent crime. You did not invent jail. You didn't invent gangs. You didn't invent a uh, conspicuous consumption. We've been doing that since slavery ended. Nothing you rap about did you create? I agree. 
But let me tell you where I disagree. You are an artist. You are an artist. An artist has a very important responsibility in any culture. In any, artists are extremely important because you create the context through which human experience takes place. Facts. Let me say it again. An artist creates the context and the atmosphere through which human experience takes place. So what am I saying? I'm saying you didn't invent the violence. You didn't invent the jails. But you advertise it. You popularize it. You instigate it. And by doing that, you feel more of the negativity. Music is powerful. Music is powerful. Music. That's why you listen to music before you go on stage. You listen to music before you go in the game. Why? It puts you in a certain what? Frame of mind. Music puts you in a certain what? Frame of mind. Music puts you in a certain what? Frame of mind. The artist has a responsibility to do what y'all do, which is what? Reflect the reality that you live. The artist has a responsibility of reflecting the reality. So you see violence, you talk about violence. You see conspicuous consumption, you talk about conspicuous consumption. You see mass incarceration, you talk about mass incarceration. I understand that. You're reflecting the reality. But let me tell you where you're selling us short. The artist has two responsibilities. The artist has two responsibilities. The artist's job is not just to reflect the reality. The artist's job is also to project a reality that our people need to become a part of. Facts. Let me say it again. You're not just supposed to reflect what you see. You're supposed to project where we need to be. Let me say it again. You're not just supposed to reflect what you see. You're supposed to project what we need to be. Let me say it again. You're not just supposed to talk about what you see. You're supposed to project, project, project where we need to be. And that's where y'all messing up because y'all not projecting a positive reality for black children. You're not taking them from where they are to where they need to be. Facts. Lesson number three. Fighting for better treatment. 400 years in two years have taught us, but we still haven't learned. Fighting for better treatment is not the same as fighting against racism. I need y'all to understand this. Let me give you an example. In the early 1830s, William Lloyd Garrison, who erroneously is considered the father of the anti-slavery movement. This is ironic because he started the American anti-slavery movement right after or right around the Nat Turner War. So why isn't Nat Turner considered the father of the movement to end slavery? But William Lloyd Garrison, who never once fired a bullet on behalf of black folks, is considered the father of anti-slavery. But I want you to stay with me. I want to show you how fighting for better treatment is not the same as fighting against racism. When William Lloyd Garrison started the American anti-slavery movement, he did it to end slavery. After slavery was ended in 1865, Frederick Douglass went to William Lloyd Garrison and said, you cannot dismantle the American anti-slavery movement because black people still don't have jobs. They still don't have equality. They still don't have schools. And guess what William Lloyd Garrison told Frederick Douglass? Guess what the so-called white father of black freedom told Frederick Douglass when Frederick Douglass questioned him about why are you dissolving the anti-slavery movement when my people might no longer have chains, but they still slaves if they don't have equality. And guess what William Lloyd Garrison said? And I'm paraphrasing. Guess what he said? 
He said, I did not start this organization to make you equal. I did not start this organization to make you equal. I started this organization to end slavery. Facts. And see, a lot of you Negroes be reading about the white abolitionists and how they help black people. But what y'all fail to understand is that most of them did not fight against slavery because they wanted you to be equal. They fought against slavery because they felt that America was becoming too black in complexion. And they was afraid that if more slaves came into America, it would ultimately begin to wipe out the white gene pool. They didn't fight against slavery for benevolent reasons. They fought against slavery for white survival facts facts they fought against slavery but they don't believe in equality they still don't none of these white liberals believe in equality show me a white liberal that ever fought to eliminate the privilege that they enjoy vis-a-vis -vis your oppression show me a white liberal who has ever fought to eliminate the privilege that they enjoy vis-a-vis -vis your oppression you can't name one you can't name one. What do I tell you? White people will fight to eliminate black homelessness. They will fight to eliminate police brutality. They will fight to find jobs. They will fight to change the laws of the prison. They will fight for a better education, but they will never fight. They will never fight and they have never fought to eliminate their white privilege. It ain't a white person in America who is interested in seeing black people be treated as equal. Because whenever you have equality, you cannot have white privilege. Wherever you have equality, you cannot have white privilege. Wherever you have equality, you cannot have white privilege facts. And y'all talking about why I want to open up my own school. Y'all talking about why we need another school. I'm not opening up no damn Hotep Academy. I'm not opening up no damn drum school. I'm opening up a school where our kids are taught critical analysis. How to think. How to plan. How to make their own money. How to build family. That's what I'm doing. You Negroes have no idea what I'm doing because I'm a hundred steps ahead of you. I'm a hundred steps. Your favorite scholar be watching my videos, studying my shit, and then plagiarizing it in a lecture. Facts. Facts. People sending me clips every day. Doc, did you see this? This, you said this. Did you see this documentary? Didn't you say this? Still in my stuff. And then y'all got a nerve to hate on me, and you plagiarizing my intellectual property. If y'all don't sit y'all asses down, keep my name out y'all mouth. Still in my damn stuff. You watch my videos and then you go do a lecture, and 85% of your lecture is Umar Johnson material. You said, what scholars do I watch? None. I don't watch nobody. I do not watch anybody's YouTube videos. Why? Because when I talk to you, I need you to know that it's 100% original and authentic, so I don't watch nobody. Facts. Facts. I don't need to watch them. They watching me. I don't need to watch you. Once in a while, I'll pop in a Dr. Clark. Once in a while, I'll pop in a Amos Wilson. Once in a while, I'll pop in a Chancellor Williams. Once in a while, I'll pop in a Dr. Ben. A Ivan Van Sertima. Uh, once in a while, I watch a little Stokely Carmichael interview. Once in a while, I watch a little King, watch a little Malcolm. I only watch Ancestors. Ain't nobody living saying nothing that I need to watch at YouTube, but you Negroes be watching and studying my YouTube, and then you say my stuff in your speech like people can't tell you stealing. Stop using my material. Get your own shit. Let's get back to the lessons tonight. Number four, class distinction, and I know this is going to make the black socialists and the Marxists and the communists upset. I don't care because if you're black, you have no business being a socialist or Marxist or a communist because all those are European mind products. Use your own damn mind. Talking about you a socialist and you ain't got no white folks. You don't have to have no white folks. You're using their mind product. You're using their mind product. 
You understand? The only solution for us is revolutionary pan-African nationalism. Not no old dusty ass treaties, some old laws, none of that shit saving black folks. The only thing that's going to save black folks is power. Might makes right, and it's the only argument that satisfies man. Facts. You digging in a dictionary looking for some shit you're going to use against white folks. You must have been smoking too much. You going to get out my face with that anti-African propaganda crap. Now. Class distinction is a joke in the black community. You only have consciousness distinctions and commitment distinctions. Let me say this again. We got this thing where we say the black middle class, the black upper class. And sometimes I'll say it to only draw a comparison. I'm not speaking of practical truth. I'm speaking figuratively to make an analysis between two seemingly homogenous groups of people. Do you understand? But there's no such thing as a black middle class for real. There's no such thing as a black upper class for real. There's no such thing as class distinction in the black community. Why do you say that, Dr. Johnson? I have a doctorate degree. I live in a white suburb. I make $250,000 a year. How can you say that I'm not distinguished by class compared to a black man who dropped out of college living in the projects in the middle of North Philadelphia. You know why there's no difference? Because class is a term that speaks to your ownership of wealth. Let me say it again. Class is a term that speaks to your ownership of wealth. What is the black man's percentage of ownership of the wealth in America? Less than 1%. And what was the black man's percentage of the ownership of the wealth in America after slavery? Less than 1%. Your ass hasn't improved not even one percentage in terms of the wealth you own in America. And you got the nerve to talk about that we got class distinctions. We ain't got class distinctions. We got cash distinctions. Let me say it again. We don't have class distinctions. We have cash distinctions. Okay? Break this down. See? See? Here's a one and a five, right? Okay? Let, let, let me make this real simple for you. Okay? Somebody makes five dollars a week. Somebody makes a dollar. Neither one of them own shit. You don't own nothing. He don't own nothing. Now, this one live in the suburbs with the white folks, $250,000. He got 25 degrees. This one lives in the ghetto with the poor black folks on welfare and Section 8 and public house. But guess what? What is the difference in the wealth? Zero. He don't own shit. He drives a Mercedes Benz, but he don't really have no assets. We don't have class. C-L-A-S-S. -S. We don't have class. We have cash distinctions. We got Negroes who make a few dollars more than the other black folk. And because they make a few dollars more than the other black folk, they think they are in a different, a different class. Hold on. Ho temper alert. Where you at? 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 I saw a hater. Let me get his little dusty ass off. I'm a funny. He gonna come out. See, I learned how to delete y'all in the process. Okay. Anyhow, are y'all following me? This is what we got. We got different levels of income. That's it. Income, not investments. Income. White folks got different levels of investments, different levels of wealth, intergenerational capital. You don't have that. We have this. Some people are low class. They bring home a dollar a week. Some people are middle class. They got five dollars a week. Some people are upper class. They got ten dollars a week. And some people are rich. Oprah, LeBron, and them, they got the 20. So you got $20 Negroes. You got $10 Negroes. You got $5 Negroes. And you got one dollar. Ain't nobody owning shit. We don't have class distinctions. We got consciousness and commitment distinctions. And I need y'all to understand that. Again, family, in case you haven't heard, Dr. Umar Johnson will be completing a tri-state 2017 Black History Month speaking tour. We're not done. I'm about to go to number five. We're not done. I'm just public service announcement. It's Black History Month. 
Tomorrow night, I will be speaking here, Atlantic City, New Jersey, at the Soldier's Home. Doors open up at 4. Program begins at 6. Atlantic City, tomorrow night, Friday, February the 17th. Saturday, I will be in Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware. A state where Harriet Tubman spent a lot of time rescuing Africans. She was all over the state of Delaware, Queen Mother Harriet. I will be at the Police Athletic League, the PAL, Police Athletic League in Wilmington, Delaware on Saturday. Doors open up at 1, program begins at 3. Doors open up at 1, program begins at 3, Saturday, Wilmington, Delaware. On Sunday, that will complete the tri-state triple header. No better place than Newark, New Jersey, Brick City, hometown of the Queen. May she forever rest in peace. The greatest female vocalist that I've ever heard in my life. And I'm talking about none other than Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston, murdered by the music industry. Whitney Houston. And so we will be in the hometown of Whitney Houston, Newark, New Jersey, Sunday afternoon. I believe the doors open up at 2 and we get started at 4. You can get your tickets right now online at princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. Get your tickets now. They will be 20 at the door. They are less than that right now. I repeat, there will be $20 at the door. Atlantic City, Wilmington, Delaware, Newark, New Jersey. You get them now, less than 20. You wait till you get there, it's going to be 20. Children 12 and under are absolutely free. Children 12 and under are absolutely free. Elders 65 and older are also absolutely free. Elders 65 and older are also absolutely free. Chicago, 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 Illinois. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be back in Chi-Town on Saturday, February the 25th. Y'all better come out, Shy. Y'all always support me. That's where I got started. I'm looking forward to seeing y'all. And yes, I will have some Nat Turner hoodies for Chicago. Yes, I will have some Nat Turner hoodies for Chicago and then on Monday the 27th Indianapolis Indiana Monday the 27th Indianapolis Indiana my first visit in two years Indianapolis can't wait to see you first visit in two years and then we're going to end the whole thing we're going to end the whole thing in the hometown the hometown of Heavy D Money earning Mount Vernon, New York. Money earning Mount Vernon, New York on the last day of Black History Month, February the 28th for a Black History Month poetry slam. I want y'all to come out and support our young people. This event is being put on by the young people. The youth are the future. I want everybody to occupy Mount Vernon, New York on the last day of 2017 Black History Month. And let's hear our young people spit that positive poetry and that positive flowetry and that positive acapella rap. It's going down. The poetry slam. It's going to be a poetry slam. Bring your poetry game, your positive poetry game to Mount Vernon, New York on February the 28th. And then on March 1st, let me double check because I believe I'm in Patterson, New Jersey. The Fred, yep. The very next day, I will be in Patterson, New Jersey, March the 1st. Shout out to Eastside High. Shout out to Principal Moody. I support you. Keep your head up. Keep doing what you're doing. You're a great educator and an asset to our people up in New York. Uh, excuse me, up in New Jersey. Shout out to all the educators in Patterson, New Jersey. And I will see y'all at the Brownstone, March the 1st, for the Fred Jordan 
Memorial Scholarship. I think I missed it last year, but I'm not going to miss it this year. Shout out to the Jordan family, Queen Mother, Natalie Montrese, and all the rest of y'all. I will see y'all in Patterson. So Mount Vernon on the 28th, Patterson on March the 1st. Facts. China, Prince of Pan-Africanism will be in China for the first time. And now Japan. Japan just sent the invite. We got Africans in Japan. See, we global. We global. Pan-Africanism means all members of the family. All members of the family. And yes, I'm African. You can call yourself whatever the hell you want to be. But I'm going to call myself an African because that word, which is an indigenous word from the continent, it comes from the original African word Afruika. Afruika. A F R I U K A. F A F R. Excuse me. A F R U I K A. Afruika. Africa is a modification of the African word Afruika, which means what? Birth of man. Facts. Facts. And Afraka are what? The original phonemes of African tongue. Af means from. Ra means God. Ka means soul. So when you say I'm African, you saying I come from the soul of Almighty God. Facts. Facts. So you can call yourself whatever you want. But as for me and mine, we are African until the day we die. Facts. Now, let's get to number five. The only education, slavery taught us this, the only education that you're ever going to get from the United States for your children is an education that prepares them for servitude, for servitude. If you don't want black children worshiping white folks for the rest of their life, you better create your own educational system facts okay the purpose of education in America is to prepare our daughters for poverty and our boys for prison let me say it again the purpose of education in America is to prepare our girls for poverty and our boys for prison do you realize 75 years ago, you did not need a college degree in order to earn a decent living? You got grandparents and I got grandparents and great grandparents who lived decent lives without a college degree. They were what? Tradesmen and tradeswomen, they could use their hands. Tradesmen and tradeswomen, they were plumbers carpenters, butchers, electricians, auto mechanics, masonry, bricklayers. They did not have to do what? They did not have to go to college. In 1970, they started deindustrializing the inner city. They started taking all the factories out of the inner city Go through, go to any inner city in America, Chicago, Indianapolis, Detroit, Philly. What you see? Abandoned factories. Abandoned factories. Most of them have been turned into what? Jails. Look at that. The place that used to provide employment for black men now provides incarceration for black men. The place that used to provide employment for black men now provides incarceration for black men. Ain't that interesting? You're going to take a factory. You're going to take a factory and instead of use it to put black men to work, you're going to use it to put black men to jail. Facts. You didn't need no college degree to live a decent life. In fact, you could even live a decent life without a high school diploma. People would leave school and work and live well, black and white. 
But in the 1970s, they decided on a plan of extermination based on mass incarceration to destabilize the black family, to take the father out the house, leave the mothers with the boys, homosexualize and effeminize the black boys in the process, deindustrialize the hood, deindustrialize the high school. They went into the high school and took out all the program. They took out the auto. They took out the chef. They took out the plumbing. They took out the carpentry. They took out the electrician. They took out the brickwork. They took it all out. They took it all out and start telling all black folks, you got to go to college if you want to make something out of yourself. My grandfather didn't have to go to college to make something out of himself. My great grandmom didn't have to go to college to make something out of ourselves. And guess what? They, they lived better and made more money in their lifetime using their hands than you make with three degrees. They made more. They lived a better life using their hands 80 years ago than you live now with all your master's degrees. Facts. It's a hustle. It's a hustle. It's a hustle. So what are you saying, Dr. Johnson? Black kids shouldn't go to college? I'm not saying that. I'm saying they do have to fulfill one criteria. If they're going to go to college. When it's time for my two babies to go to college. My two daughters. And hopefully God blesses me with a son soon and a wife. But listen, when it's time for my daughters to go to college. I got one question. One question. Before I put this money out here, princess. Before I put my money. Are you committed to being the best? That's all I want to know. Are you committed to being the best teacher? Are you committed to being the best social worker? Are you committed to being the best pharmacist? Are you committed to being the best engineer? Are you committed to being the best author? Are you committed to being the best psychologist? Why do I need them to be committed to being the best before I write any check to any university? Because there is no room in America for second place. Facts. If you sending your children to college to become second place, you're wasting your money. There is no room for second. You are the best or you are nothing. Facts. And that's what's wrong with our kids. We send them all to college and they get these degrees, but they're not expert. They didn't master the information. They're not the best. Be the best. Or keep your money in your pocket. Facts. Number six, and this going to blow your mind. White people only respect black people who don't respect white supremacy. Facts. Listen, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again slower so you can follow me. White people only respect black people who don't respect white supremacy that's right you will never get respect from white folks as long as they know you scared of them you'll never get respect from white folks as long as they know you want to be approved and condoned and sanctioned by them they respect nat turner because nat turner said f y'all they respect harriet tubman because harriet tubman said i got a right to one of two things freedom or death that's what harriet said Queen Mother Harry, who stood not even five feet, the woman wasn't even five feet tall. She said, I got a right to one or the other, freedom or death. And if I couldn't have one, I'm going to take the other. You only get respect from white folks when you stop being scared of what they can do to you. Facts. Shout out to all the historically black colleges, Cheney University. Shout out to Cheney in Lincoln. Will Beforce. I don't know which one of y'all is first. I know that debate. From what I understand, Cheney is the first black institution of higher learning. Cheney. Lincoln is the first degree granting institution of higher learning. And I believe Will Beforce is the first black institution to call itself a university. Okay? 
because we took the kids to Lincoln and Cheney, the children on last year's college tour. We getting ready for the second college tour. So make sure y'all get ready June 28th to July the 12th. That's why I'm taking March off. I'm not going to be doing a lot of speaking in March because I got to finalize the college tour. I got to finalize the Africa tour. I got to go ahead and find one of these schools for FDMG. So um, March is going to be a light, a light, a light March for Dr. Umar because we got to take care of the administrative and executive side of being Dr. Papa. You understand? See, on the stage, that's the prince. But in the office, that's Dr. Papa. So I got to handle the business of Dr. Papa. You feel me? So shout out to all the HBCU. Shout out. I was at uh, Norfolk State. Shout out to Norfolk. I was at Bowie. I'll be at Morgan State. I left out Morgan. My apologies. Dr. Umar Johnson will be in Baltimore, Maryland on Wednesday, 2-2-2. Two, two, two. I repeat, Wednesday, February the 22nd, 2 Two, two. Doors open up at 6 o'clock. Program starts at 7 o'clock. It will be my first time speaking at Morgan State University. It's free. It's open to the public. You don't need no tickets. So stop texting me for tickets for Morgan. It's free. Come as you are. The city from which Frederick Douglass escaped from slavery to freedom. Baltimore, Maryland. Be more careful. Rest in peace, Freddie Gray. I want to see the whole DMV at Morgan State on Wednesday. Shout out to all the brothers and sisters who came out to show Dr. Umar Love last night in the city of Gabriel Prosser, Richmond, Virginia. Much love, Richmond, Virginia. I enjoyed everybody yesterday. Good conversation with the Q&A as always. Now, number seven. Fear is the greatest weapon racism uses against black people. Fear. Fear. Not money. Not jail. Not law. Fear. Psychological fear. They control you through your fear. Fear. So the first thing black people have to drop. See, we talk about we got to drop the uh, miseducation. We got to drop the Eurocentric mindset. We got to drop the religions. We got to drop the holidays. We got to drop the dress code. We got to drop the weave and the perm. We got to drop the white women. You do. But guess what? You can drop all that. If you ain't drop your fear of white folks, Ain't no need to drop nothing else because as Maya Angelou said, rest in peace to Queen Mother Maya Angelou, one of our great poets. Rest in peace to Queen Mother Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou was asked of all the virtues. Queen Mother Maya Angelou was asked of all the virtues, which one is the most important? Of all the virtues, which one is the most important? And guess what she said? She said, of all the virtues, the most important one is courage. She said, courage. She said, because if you don't have courage, you can't practice no other virtue. Facts. 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 What do I say? What does Dr. Umar's five assessments, five assessments of conscious people? What are the five assessments for Dr. Umar? Courage, consciousness, commitment, consistency, and creativity. Courage is number one. Courage. If you scare the white folks, you will be no good. Courage, consciousness, consistency, commitment, creativity. Courage. Nat Turner, Harriet Tubman. Shaka Zulu, Patrice Lumumba, Steve Biko, Thomas Sankara, Amakal Cabral, Menelik II, His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie I, Ja, Rastafari. Shout out to all my Rastafari family, brothers and sisters. Shout out to my Rastas down in South Africa, Johannesburg and Cape Town and other points in between. I love my Rasta family. They Garveyites like me, revolutionary Pan-African nationalists like me. Shout out to the Naya Bingi. Shout out to the EWF. Shout out to the 12 tribes. And of course, shout out to the Bobo Shanti Rastafari. 
Marcusai, Emmanuelai, Selassie, Jah, Rastafari. So brothers and sisters, we got to lose our fear, white folks. Number eight. Number eight. At the end of the day, white folks will never truly be your friend. They can't. Why? Because they have an obligation. And you see this. How many times you watch a slave movie where the black slave and the white person, real good friends, they grow up together and then they get to a certain age. And then all of a sudden the white friend begin to step off. You've seen this, right? Or even if they adults, the white man treat the black woman a certain way or the white woman treat the black man a certain way. And then all of a sudden, one day out the blue, the white person tells them you are still an N word. And you see the look on a black person's face like, oh, my God, I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends. You can never be the friend of a white supremacist. Let me say it again. You can never have a white supremacist as a friend. Let me say it one more time. You can never have a white supremacist as a friend. And since all white people practice racism, you can never have white friends. Facts. Number nine, emotions do not confuse white people as to the status of blacks. Let me say this again, because this is an important one. Emotion. I have a white husband. He loves me. I have a white wife. She loves me. That might be true, but that does nothing to change the power differential that exists between us and them. Let me say it again. I don't care how white people feel about you. I don't care how they feel about you. I don't care what kind of emotions they have about you. Guess what? They will never change the way they treat the group you belong to. They might treat you a little differently, but they will never treat black people a little differently. Did you hear what I just said? They might treat you a little differently, but the way they feel about you does not change how they treat members of our in-group. Fact, a black man with a white wife, that white woman will still be just as racist towards other black folk as she was before she married the black man. Your white best friend will be just as racist towards other black folk as she was before you became her best friend. Your relationship with white people does not change the way they interact with black folks. Wake up. Learning disabled Negroes. Some of y'all asking questions. Respectfully, because I don't mind questions. But you're asking questions that I feel I've already answered millions of times. Somebody just said, do you not think we can all coexist peaceably? And do you know what my response to that is? Do you understand white supremacy? It's real. Do you un see? That's why I'm doing this because y'all still have a learning disability. We just went through eight steps, and you come right back with the same ridiculous question because you love white folks. See, you can take the slave out of slavery, but only the slave can take the slavery. Out of himself. You can take the slave out of slavery, but only the slave can take the slavery out of himself. Number 10. It will only get worse until you do something about it. I know you don't want to hear this. I know you don't want to hear this. It will only get worse until you do. Let's go back to slavery. In slavery, they had us as slaves, 
They dehumanized us. The fugitive slave law. The mass killings of black folks. The punishments they were using got so bad that Nat Turner had to chill that shit out with his slave revolt. Gabriel Prosser and Denmark Vesey had to chill that shit out. Toussaint La Overture, Jean Jacques Dessalines, Henry Christoph, Bookman, they had to chill that shit out. Listen, y'all need to understand something about behavioral science. Y'all need to understand something about behavioral science. And that is behavior will always get worse. If you do nothing about it, your child's behavior, your husband's behavior, your neighbor's behavior, police behavior, your pet's behavior, behavior in living organisms will only get worse. And what did I say? I was in Miami when George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing Trayvon. I was in Miami when George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing Trayvon Martin. Rest in peace to Trayvon. Shout out to Trayvon's father. He and I had a chance to chat for a few minutes. When they let Zimmerman off, who was not even a cop, he was a town. I said more black boys will be killed by the police because there has been no consequence for this action. When Freddie Gray got killed, more black. Blacks will be murdered because there was no systemic, comprehensive consequence. We appreciated the revolt and rebellion. I support those revolts and those rebellions. Yes, I do. It is important that you have revolts and rebellions. As Dr. King said, the revolt and the rebellion is the language of the oppressed. You would not have to burn the city down if they listened to you. You wouldn't have to burn the city down if they treated you equally. You wouldn't have to burn the city down if you had opportunities. Rebellions are always the outgrowth of oppression. And don't tell me it doesn't accomplish anything. You know why you can't never tell me that? Why can you not tell Dr. Umar that rebellions don't accomplish anything? The reason you cannot ever tell me that rebellions don't accomplish anything because the United States of America was birthed from a rebellion. The United States of America was birthed from a rebellion. The United States of America was birthed from a rebellion known as the Boston Massacre, where a group of citizens stood up to protest against what? Police brutality. Protest against what? Police brutality. The British soldiers were harassing citizens in Boston that triggered the Boston Massacre and led to the Declaration of Independence, led to the American Revolution, led to the United States of America. So if a if a protest against police brutality can create an independent America, then it can damn sure create an independent black America. Facts. It will only get worse until you do something about it. Number 11. I know I said 10, but can I give you all four more? Can I give y'all four more before I get some shut eye? Because I got to wake up early. I got a radio interview in the morning, pre-record for Wilmington, Delaware. Okay? Now, number 11. I know y'all don't want to hear this. Because y'all some multicultural, everybody else loving ass people. Guess what number 11 is? Immigrants will never join your cause. Can I say it again? Immigrants will never join help you. Can I say it one more time? All you multicultural Negroes waiting for Chinese and Arabs and Indians and Southern Europeans and Latinos and Mexicans to help black folk, you foolish Negroes will be waiting for the rest of your life. Study slavery. Study slavery. When they brought the Chinese in here, they used the Chinese to do what? 
keep you from working on the railroads. They brought the Indians in here. They brought the Indians to do what? Use them to keep you from getting jobs in the agricultural sector. The same thing they're doing today. They got the Mexicans coming in to take all the low wage earning jobs. And I'm not against the Mexicans or the Indians or the Chinese. I'm simply saying that anyone who comes to America and wants to live the American dream must help the white man keep you in your place. Let me say it again. Anyone who comes to America and wants to live the American dream must help the white man keep you in your place. So if you think that the Chinese and the Arab and the Latino and the East Indian is going to lose their green card and lose their residency card and lose their work permit and lose their student visa and lose their shot at becoming a U.S. citizen to help 45 million materialistically addicted white Jesus loving scared of white folks, black folks, you'll be waiting for the rest of your life. Immigrants ain't come here to help black folks. Immigrants came here to help themselves. Facts. Number 12. Slavery taught us this too. 400 years. Science, the white man's science, is a religion. It is not a discipline. In slavery, they said they did research that proved black folks was half monkeys. They did research that proved black people had tails. They did research that proved that black people were of the devil. They did research that proved that black people were intellectually inferior to white folks. They did research on this and research on that. The white man's research ain't science. It is his opinions and his doctrine and his platform passed off as empirical evidence so you don't challenge it. Whenever the white man comes and says, we got some studies that prove black people, we got some studies that prove black people, we got some studies that, listen, I don't want to hear about no white man studies. I had a Negro come to me talking about, can you show me some data that proves the learning disability don't exist? Why in the hell would the white man do research on anything that undermines his 21st century African Holocaust project against you? You will never see research that contradicts what white folks are teaching. The homosexuality. They say we found a gene that makes people gay. Of course they're going to say that because they're pushing homosexuality on black boys. What you expected to say? The science always corroborates the political agenda. The science always corroborates the political agenda. You Negroes is great. Can I see your research? Can I see your... Do you know who, do, who does the research in America? Who does the research in America? White universities. Yeah, Howard do a little. A couple black colleges do a little. But 95% of the research in America is done by white colleges. Amos Wilson. Read Amos Wilson's Developmental Psychology of the Black Child. In Amos Wilson's Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, Ancestor Amos found research from white folks. That showed black kids were more intelligent the younger they were. That birthed black children from birth to five were more intelligent than any other child. And of course, from birth to five is the true period to assess intelligence prior to formal educational instruction. Once you start learning, you're not measuring intelligence. You're measuring what? Acculturation and instructional quality. That's it. Amos Wilson found research that white folks threw out. They hid it. They put it to the side. Why did they put it to the side? Because anything that contradicts what they are trying to sell and what they are trying to kill will never, ever be published. You don't believe me? I got a little homework project for all you all working at all y'all college students. Listen up, college students. And they'll never offer me a job to teach at your college. They'll never, they'll bring me in to speak. Oh, they love to bring me in for one day. Oh, they'll bring me in to speak for one day. But they ain't going to give me no professor job. Could you imagine me in the psychology department? 
Could you imagine me in the political science department? Could you imagine me in the education department? Could you imagine me in the Africana studies department? And let me deal with this Africana shit real quick. I know I'm pissing everybody off tonight. That's my job to bring about an intellectual insurrection. Do you understand? I was born on 821. What happened on 821? Buddha was born. Jesus was born. Krishna was born. Nat Turner War. George Jackson War. First day of slavery. Frederick Douglass Feud Slave Convention. Haitian Revolution. 821. My job is to bring an intellectual insurrection. Listen. And this is no slight to the Africana studies. Don't get me wrong. I want y'all to hear what I'm telling you. Because white folks are clever. What did I tell y'all about charter schools? I said, if you want to get rid of the black folks, open up a charter school. Hire all the white teachers. The white teachers will move into the black community. They will buy up all the real estate. And in five to ten years, the black kids that go to that charter school won't even be able to. Their parents won't even be able to afford to live in that neighborhood no more. They're using charter schools to clean black people out of the inner city. Remember I told you that? Well, guess what they do at the university level? Guess what they do at the university? They do the same shit. Guess what the universities do? If I'm a white university and I want to take over North Philly like Temple University has done, if I'm a white university and I want to take over whatever big university is in your city, because every black community got a big white university that wants to move the black folks out. Guess what they do? Guess what they do? They're going to start an Africana studies program. Why does a white racist university want to start an Africana studies program? program because if we start an Africana studies program that will endear black people to us it will look like we're being multicultural and Afrocentric and not only do we make a lot of money off black kids who want to learn who they are from white professors not only do we want to make a lot of money off black kids who want to learn who they are from white professors not only do we make a lot of money from black kids who want to know who they are from white professors guess what when we start expanding into the neighborhood, building more buildings, opening up different colleges. College of Medicine took over one project. College of Social Science took over another project. The College of Engineering took over another project. The College of Education took over another section of the ghetto. The black folks ain't going to say nothing because it's in the name of education. And since we have an Afrocentric PhD, Afrocentric master's, Afrocentric bachelor's program that makes us look good to the poor black folks who don't want to do nothing but be accepted by us in the first place, having an Africana studies program at the white racist university helps us push more black people out of their own neighborhood and then guess what they do after they take over the neighborhood guess what they do they get rid of the africana studies program facts facts temple university did it after temple university took over north philly my neighborhood. They then tried to kill the pass up program and then they then tried to kill the PhD Africana Studies program for what I understand and it wasn't until the black folks protested that they had to put it back. They only used it. They only used the Africana Studies program and the charter school to get on your good side long enough to take you over. What's the second rule of racism? White folks don't share power with black folks. White folks don't share power with black folks. Two more. We down to the last two. Atlantic City, I want to see everybody tomorrow. Okay. I got friends coming through, some homies I ain't seen in years. They're going to ride down from Philly. Got some New Jersey family coming through. So come on through. If you live 
the Central Jersey up. I want to see you in Newark on Sunday. If you live Central Jersey South, I want to see you in Atlantic City tomorrow night. I'm hoping to see my Camden, New Jersey family tomorrow night and my Willingboro, New Jersey family tomorrow night. I'm hoping to see all y'all, so make sure y'all come on through Philly. Philly, y'all can do Wilmington or Atlantic City or y'all can do both. You feel me, Philly? So Philadelphia, come on out, show love. Also, Philadelphia, I will be interviewed live on WDAS Sunday morning. I repeat, I will be interviewed live on WDAS Sunday morning. Dr. Umar Johnson will be interviewed live for the first time on WDAS Philadelphia Sunday morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 a.m. And then I'm going to ride on up to Newark right after the early, early, early Sunday morning interview. So Newark, New Jersey, I got a question for all my family up in Elizabeth and Montclair in Newark and Patterson. Since I'm going to get up there early, is there any black-owned breakfast restaurant open on Sunday in Newark, New Jersey? I need a black-owned breakfast restaurant in Patterson or Elizabeth or Montclair. Okay, I need that. So if there, if, if that's there, I need one of those Hotep veggie restaurants so I can go and get my breakfast on. All right, because it's going to be early, so I need some food. Okay, unless, unless somebody making home-cooked breakfast. You feel me? Number 13. Ah, the homework. Oh, thank you for reminding me. ADHD, African Destiny Hyperactivity Disorder. Listen, the homework assignment for everybody in college when you go to class tomorrow, ask your professor what percentage of research studies that do not produce a positive effect are actually published in the research. In other words, when research is done, let's say they're doing research on a certain medicine, okay? When the research is done, any research that's negative, that means it didn't show no effect. If the research doesn't show any effect, they don't like to publish it. They only like to publish research. So let me give you an example. There was research done on the intelligence of black children compared to white children. There was 100 different studies. 80 of these studies prove that there was no difference between the intelligence or that the black kids was a little smart. So there was 100 research studies, right? 80 of these studies proved that there was no difference in the intelligence between black students and white students, or that the Africans were a little brighter, right? 10 out of 100 showed that the white kids were a little brighter. Out of those 100 studies, guess which ones are going to get published? The only study they're going to publish are the 10 that does what? Reinforce the belief that society has in the first place. Okay, let's say they do 100 studies on ADHD medicine and 90 studies show that ADHD medicine is harmful to the kids. 10 studies say it's not harmful. Guess which studies are going to get published? The ones that reinforce the agenda of the drug companies. So when you go to college, ask your professors. What percentage of research that does not go along with the agenda of the publication board or the agenda of society gets published? They never publish research that doesn't support the racist platform of American society. Check the research. They taught us this in grad school. When I was going through grad school, I was paying attention to the stuff that matter. What did Marcus Garvey say? His Excellency, the provisional prophet of Pan-Africanism, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, leader of the largest black organization in modern history, the only black leader in the 21st century to be a leader of black people globally. Let me say it again. Marcus Garvey is the only leader since slavery who is a leader on all six continents where humans are no other black man you can name. No other black man you can name. No other black man you 
African name was simultaneously leader of black folks everywhere on earth. Garvey was president of the Pan-African Empire. Facts. Number 13. The preacher's job is to keep you docile. The job of the black church in slavery is the same job of the black church today to keep you focused on heaven while you live it in hell. And this is why black churches that don't do the work of the black community have to be shut down and put out of business, shut down and put out of business. Now, let me go back to you, my brother. Those of y'all putting out these STD statistics about black folks. Here we go again with the research. I'm about to drop another bomb on you, Negroes. Here we go. When they tell you 80% of black teenagers has a sexually transmitted disease, ask them how did they find that out. You know what they do? This is what statistics is. With statistics, okay, you take a sample. You take a sample. So let's say I'm in Atlantic City right now, right? Let's say you got a million black teenagers in Atlantic City, hypothetically, a million, right? They will take a sample, a hundred black teens, and test a hundred black teens. And because 80 of the 100 black teens that they tested had gonorrhea or chlamydia, they will then put out a statistic because you infer the stat from the sample. You infer what's going on in the population from the sample. That's called religion. That's called guesswork. That's called making an assumption. That's called a hypothesis. So because 80 of the 100 black children in the sample had gonorrhea or chlamydia, they will generalize and say 80% of teenagers in Atlantic City have a STD. They don't know that shit. They didn't test all the teenagers in Atlantic City. They only tested a hundred. And sometimes they didn't even test a hundred. They simply made a generalization from a small little sample of reality. And that's why I told y'all, y'all better stop running with the white man statistics. Do I quote statistics? Yes, I do. But I only quote statistics that confirm what my experience has validated. I only quote statistics that have confirmed or appear to confirm information that my first hand, first hand, first hand experience has validated facts. The job of the preacher is to keep you dumb, deaf, and blind. We give the black church $14 million every Sunday. We give the black church nationally over $14 million every Sunday. No schools, no factories, no supermarkets, no convenience stores, no gas stations, no airlines, no import export. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? If the job of the church is to get you ready to die, if the job of the church is to prepare you for heaven, what the hell they need so much money for? Because you don't need no money in heaven. I said you don't need no money in heaven. I'm going to tell you like I always tell you. Any religion that tells me I have to die in order to go to heaven when the white man got his heaven now and the Chinese got his heaven now and the Arab got his heaven now and the East Indian got his heaven now and he got his heaven in my neighborhood while I'm living in hell. That's a religion I don't need. I want my heaven here. I want my heaven now and I'm going to get it. Or die trying like Nat Turner. I'm going to get it. Or die trying like Harriet Tubman. I'm going to get it. Or die trying like Ida B. Wells. I'm going to get it. Or die trying like Denmark Vesey. Any religion that doesn't teach me to fight for what's right. Any religion that doesn't teach me to fight for what's right. Any religion that doesn't teach me to fight for what's right. Is a religion. That is preparing me to accept what is wrong. Facts. Last law. 
And you Negroes kill me when y'all start talking about when you going to talk about this and when you going to talk about it. I always get somebody at my lectures right after the end of the lecture. They'll come up and say, well, you didn't talk about it. Excuse you. It's a two hour lecture. You expect me in two hours to talk about every issue affecting black folk in a two hour lecture, especially when you Negroes need to hurry up and get out so you can go home and catch the reruns of Empire and Mama D and Little Scrappy and the Housewives and all that shit. Huh? You go to class for what? A semester is what? 14 weeks to learn about one subject. You go to class 14 to 17 weeks. And you expect me to take 14 to 17 weeks and put that shit in two hours. You done lost your damn mind. That's why when we open up the FDMG Academy, we're going to have schools at night. We're going to have a night school. How many adults want to come to Dr. Umar Johnson's night school on political science? Pan-African political science at night. We're going to eat together, talk, converse, learn. You got to take a test, though. You got to pass. You got to pass. Okay? You got to pass. Just like all the presidents of the National Independent Black Parent Association, they're going to have to take a test in order to become a permanent chapter. And if any of you out there want to start a study group, if any of you out there want to start a study group, if any of you out there would like to start a study group of the National Independent Black Parent Association, please send me an email. Dr. Umar Johnson at Yahoo.com. D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson at Yahoo.com. You can start a study group. You can start a study group and start meeting with parents, supporting parents, finding out what's going on. You don't have to come to a training conference to start a study group, but you must come to a training conference to become a chapter. So the basic level is a study group. Anybody who wants to start a study group, you can. You can convert that study group into a chapter by coming to our next National Independent Black Parent Association training conference, which will be in May in the Midwest, which will be in May in the Midwest. It might be Detroit. It might be Milwaukee. It might be Indianapolis. OK, it might be Chicago, but it will be in May. But if you want to start your study group right now, you want to start bringing parents in so y'all can just talk. The study group talks. You don't do no advocacy work. You don't do no organizing. You just provide support. We need study groups in every city. If you're interested in starting a study group, send me an email. Send me an email. Start getting our parents together to support each other. And when you're ready to turn it into a chapter and become political, not just social, I need to see you in May at the Midwest, Midwest Regional Training Conference. That's right. I'm about organization. I ain't part of the whole tech movement. I'm not just interested in information, information. Come and get this information. That's what they say on YouTube. Come get this information. What the hell is information without organization? What the hell is information without organization? Uh, Brother Quentin, I already said all black churches are not the same. Sound like you wasn't listening. But I'm going to let you ride because you wasn't hating. You feel me? But I need y'all to listen because y'all love to criticize and you didn't even. I said that. There's exceptions to every rule. I said that. I speak in churches all the time, my brother. I said that. Please listen when I speak. Don't be so quick to cut in. Rule number 14, nothing you do will move white folks to bring true equality to black folks in America. This is the last one. There's nothing you can do. You fought in World War I. You fought in World War II. You fought in the War of 1812. You fought in the Spanish-American War. You fought in the Civil War. You was Tuskegee. You integrated baseball and football. Okay? You built the railroads. You pledged allegiance. You died. You was human guinea pigs. You invented things. You did everything you possibly could do to prove your worth and love for America. You have not been treated equal. You will never be treated equal. And you need to understand that. Y'all thought Obama was going to make y'all equal. You got the NAACP still trying to make you equal. The Urban League still trying to make you equal. Congressional Black Caucus still trying to make you equal. Equality is a sin to white folks. 
because it eliminates white privilege. You don't need to be equal to them. You need to be equal with each other. We must practice equality amongst ourselves, not with them. Have you ever asked yourself, why does a people who have been through so much continue to beg for participation in the life of their oppressor? You've been raped, killed, sodomized, abused, beaten, disgraced, the human, and you keep going back to the same people after 400 years and two years asking for a seat at his table. You are sick. The first law of existence is self-preservation. The first law of existence is self-preservation. How in the hell do you keep running back into a burning house? What did Malcolm say? Master, we sick. We sick. My country. My president. My Congress. My football team, my city, you don't own shit. You ain't even allowed in there. If they catch you with a hood on your head, your ass to be dead. Please give it up. Please give it up. So in conclusion, family, it's the Prince of Pan-Africanism. I just want to thank y'all for the support you give me through the years. Appreciate all the love. Never take you for granted. Thanks for all the positive text messages and inboxes and Facebooks and tweets and Instagrams and so forth and so on. So again, I'm going to take March off because I have to do 